Well, it's lovely to see you all. Um, I know some of you, <laughs> I don't know all of you. Um, so obviously I, I look forward to getting to know you better and to having this conversation. Um, when Nathan asked me to come and talk, my first reaction was to say, I don't really want to be talking at people. I really want us to have a conversation um, because I think that's what needs to happen. I don't want to be <laughs> talking at people. Definitely don't like that. Um, those of you who know me know that really my work, I believe change will happen um, one imperfectly perfect conversation at a time. So I really believe in that. Uh, this is what I do on, on the podcast and what I do regularly. But also, um, I do think that the, the stories we tell and the narrative that we we you know put out there has a massive, massive uh, impact. Um, and I think that's where the change um, can be. So I thought I would just briefly share what I think. So starting with that, starting that I do think that it is possible for change to happen. Um, so my perspective has been mainly focused on the UK. Uh, I know that Daniel is obviously uh, he, he, not in the UK, um, nor is Maggie. But knowing for like speaking with Maggie, I know that obviously in the States, it's similar situation as we have in the UK so I think education needs a revamp throughout the world um, it's not just for us in the UK um, and I guess what what I view as as you know one way forward is to talk start talking about flourishing so the terminology I use is flourishing um, again, I think it's really important that we don't get attached to those labels. So some people will talk about thriving. Other people will, will use other words. Uh, as a linguist, I think it, it does not matter what word we use. It's what we resonate with that is much more important. Um, but for me, flourishing is literally what I've been researching for the last nine years. Um, and I'm about to embark on a PhD. So just to give you a bit of background on what I've been doing is I returned to higher education after almost nine years of not being in higher education and running my own language school. So my background is linguistics and cultural agility. Um, before that, I was, you know, I'm, I am a trained language teacher. So obviously you can tell both from my accent probably and my name that I'm French originally. Um, but I've been living in the UK for quite a long time and I also lived in Spain. And so I've trained as a as a French and an English and Spanish teacher. And so I've been in the system for well, almost 26, 27 years. Um, and then I returned to higher education and to say I was horrified by what I came back to in 2014 is an understatement. So it was just really uh, a shock to see the low subjective well-being of the students. Um, and sadly, I also experienced the worst outcome of mental ill health in students with one of our students during their you know, year abroad. Um, and that has been a key driver to to want to see change because I do think that we adults have a duty of care to our young people. And when I see so many young people who actually suffer from mental distress or mental ill health, um, I, I have a big issue with that. I think that's just completely unacceptable. Um, and so my research in flourishing is not mental ill health. So what I do is is in the sphere of what I call salutogenic. So it's a big word. I'm, I'm sorry, but really salutogenic is looking at this innate well-being and, and wisdom that we all have um, and that can, we can all look after. Uh, and for me, flourishing is this ability to navigate the, the peaks and the valleys of life and the, in everything in between. Um, and to have the resources, you know, when we when we experience in, in particular the challenges to to find the resources to you know, to find the courage to ask for help and to have the support in our in our valleys, but also to to be celebrated and to celebrate others in their peaks. Um, 
And so my research was really focused on individuals, let's sort out individuals and then we'll be okay. And I quickly realized that that wasn't gonna work. So I used to focus on flourishing eye, like let's have flourishing individuals. And I could also see that we we measure, not that I agree with that, but obviously our societies measure uh, societal well-being with the flourishing us, like the you know GDP. Why would you do that? But no, that's another conversation. And we measure societal well-being. But I realized there was a big thing missing, which is community well-being. So we don't we don't know what community well-being is. And I think in the UK, I would argue that communities have slowly been eroded and that there aren't a lot of communities. It's individuals coming together. Um, and so the reason I'm here and the reason I want to talk with you is I really believe that there is an urgent need to create more communities, as in flourishing communities. I believe that those communities need to be anchored in the culture where we are. So, you know, the culture in the UK will be different than in you know, South Africa or in the States or in Mexico for Lauren, right, or Germany. And I don't think we should just have a one size fits all, which is what the really our um, our current schooling system is saying we need. And so what I've been exploring for the last two years in particular is shining the light on amazing disruptors and people who are doing amazing things in the changing the face of education Maggie being one of the people I have features on the podcast so you can go and check out uh, you know and Alan as well with his values work so um I do think that it's really important that we shine the light on the innovators and the innovations. But I, my, my biggest sort of drive is all the initiatives seem to be really all just dotted around and they're not connected. And I often talk about myself in my professional life as a fungus and as a mycelium. And I love connecting with people. That's what where I get my energy. And I do think that it's time to connect all the um, amazing dots uh, like mycelium does and it's time for us to come together and share share resources and I would add one last thing before I then get everybody to come in and and you know share your thoughts I think probably the the two uh, barriers to that are two things that are not often discussed or at least not openly the first one is we've all been schooled and probably because we're all adults here so we've all been schooled probably over schooled and so we too have been told that we are individuals who need to compete and we also live in, in capitalist societies that tell us we need money and we need to earn a living and all of those things. And I think the fact that we have to put food on the table and pay the bills sometimes makes it a little bit challenging because then it's like, I just have to like sell my stuff or I have to find people to, to, to come and work with me. You know, it's not always like that. It's not always about like selling the stuff. But the reality is right now we use money as currency to, in exchange for service. And we need that money to pay the bills and to uh, and to put food on the table. And so really, my question is, how do we get that right? So how do we get to shine the light on amazing innovators so everybody can eat and everybody can pay the bills and uh, you know, for us in the UK in winter, we need heating. And right now with the cost of living, putting the uh, heating on can be quite challenging for some people. So how do we do that whilst also not having the belief that our solution is the solution because I don't think there is one solution. It's like the whole hero's journey, right? Uh, and I can say that in a very... Um, you know, I see it in others because it's in me. I often have to rein it in because I was like that three years ago, that ego who thought she would be, you know, solving the problem on her own. Cringe and laugh at the same time now. Um, and so I know it's an and, you know, as I often sort of discuss with Maggie, uh, but it's for me, it's a, 
how do we all come together? How do we recognize our unique uniqueness, this fragrance in this garden called life, our gift in the garden called life that we all have, and that only some people will need to hear first to get on their next step of the journey. But yet, how do we create that community so that we see more change so that it's not work in isolation. And I'm not pretending one minute that here I am, I've got the answers, I've got no answers. I've probably got more questions than answers, <laughs> but I would love to hear your thoughts and for us to have a conversation. Thank you, Fabian. Yeah, I think that's a, a beautiful way to start the conversation. Um, so I think we're we're a small enough group that we can just open open the floor an open conversation about it. So to kind of reiterate the question then is how how do we raise awareness around the different people, the innovators, the creators, the disruptors, um, in a way that is both, I guess, authentic and allows them to thrive while doing the good work, right? Without, so. without reproducing a system that says, hey, my thing, like, you know, because really our current schooling system is saying there is one way and one path. And I think we really need to have an individualized pathway for our young people and for all of us. And so how do we facilitate this? You know, I can only own fully my own journey and my own journey the last 15 years has been of, you know, unlearning, de-schooling myself. It's an ongoing journey and I've needed different teachers teachers and different people along the way so I know that it's likely to be the same for other people so my question is how do we get people to you know get to Maggie and her amazing book when they need it like easily and effortlessly um because that's what some people will need right now and then you know and then maybe possibly do you know look at neuroscience like Treasure's doing or you know Alan with the values how do we do all of that um whilst not suggesting that there is a one size fits all and that you know yeah Maggie what you were just saying about the journey was really resonating with me because the thought that was partially formed in my head um was this idea of being in a landscape of learning that is full of others human and beyond who are also learning and changing and the encounters that we have are so necessary for shaping who we are or who we are becoming uh, because we are expressions of our relationships right so so this makes me feel that if I look back on those experiences and how I might have accessed some of those relationships more intentionally, um, or when I was looking for something in particular. I think if I if I stay with that landscape vision, which is has also um, emerged in my thinking about how we might think about learning landscapes. I think maybe if there are some signposts um that sort of you know maybe guide you in a in a direction and I, signpost i'm using as like some analogous symbolic metaphor that, <laughs> that i don't know exactly what that would look like but i'm just saying that maybe my journey would have been expedited if that's a if that's a desirable quality um if there had been more signage along the way so that I might have made choices maybe that that you know I mean honestly it took me until I mean I'm still learning and I kind of feel like the learning was necessary um, I probably spent too long in the grip of the industrial schooling model unhappily trying to you know work against it and I could have used more support and relationships then, I think, uh, but I didn't know how or didn't have the time to access them. 
Maggie, when you're when you're saying about um, signposts, is it the the signposts to direct you in the right way? But how how would you do you think the signposts are enough? Like if you saw the signpost, would you know which route then to take, or or do you feel like it's more? Because um, it, it know, kind of like brought to me the idea of like a pick your own journey. I don't know if you ever had those books so, where you could read and roll your dice and find your way. Um, yeah, I remember those books. I, I'm I'm a little older than those books, but um, but I remember when they when they came out and the elementary school kids were like, "Oh, these books are so cool!" And then I was like, "Yeah, this is kind of neat," you know. So I actually wrote a couple of those kinds of books for my daughter at one point. So I know exactly what you mean. Um, but I I feel like I might not have been able to make those choices um, at that time. However, it is so important for an educator's well-being uh, to know that there are other people who are feeling the same way, who are fighting the same fight, who are even thinking of other possibilities, alternative pathways, like, I didn't know it was okay to leave my job and go start another school. Like, you know, who would do that? <laughs> you know? So I, it took me a long time to have the courage to, you know, I knew I was fighting against a system of harm. And I was in a daily effort to protect my students from it and to help them grow into flourishing um, beings. Um, you know, in spite of it all, I was very aware of that, but I didn't know there were other people who were, you know, having the same pressures and considerations. And it might have helped if I did. And so thank you, thank you for whomever, to whomever put the thing about ecoversities in there. Is that you, John? Thank you. Because that's exactly the kind of signposting that I think, you know, we didn't have, when I was started teaching, we didn't have personal computers. So, so that gives you an idea of like, maybe my evolution, you know, is parallel to the evolution of signposts and, and communities like this that can be global. And I mean, this to me is all still a miracle. And, you know, when John posed the thing about ecoversities, yeah, I've heard about ecoversities, but I had no idea how to find them. So thank you again for for that. And this is exactly why these kinds of conversations are so healing in a way and and healthful uh, because now, you know, I am I feel like we are all connected, even though we were not able to really have our neurological systems connected because we're meeting on Zoom but I still feel like we're all connected and so grateful to be part of this conversation. I don't have any answers, but <laughs> I'm happy to reflect with people. Daniel, I saw you had your hand up. Uh... Thanks. Um, thanks Maggie for that. Um, I, I, I relate. Um, and uh, it, I mean, what, jumps to mind for me is, and especially if, if it's geographically dispersed, if, such as this, it's like just high quality content, um, almost like as curated and organized directory format, where it's like, there's almost a web of information that as you navigate your way, it's super easy to find things that are very relevant to your thing as opposed to maybe more of a, um, a wormhole search through through the internet, um, which is, I mean, it's how I found this. So, I mean, it's still useful. Um, so, yeah, I think that's the best way. It's like whenever I've found someone that's totally outside of my, my sort of circle of influence is, is when they've been like, Put together by someone else or in a in a in a context that is sort of familiar um to my to my search 
Um, so, yeah, I think that that that's literally what comes to mind for me is is the the first thing. Um, and the useful links keep coming. Thank you, Nathan. Yeah, that's that's all from me. Thank Alan, you, Sherry. did you want to come in? I saw you wanted to come in, Alan. Yeah, thanks, Fabian. And Maggie, thank you for um, prompting metaphoric thinking. So just listening to you, there's a, a number that popped into my mind. So this is really, uh, I guess, wondering whether this will help people go somewhere um, more than anything else. So here they are. The first one that came to mind was from a user perspective in the education system. It seems to me that our students are treated like battery hens and they need to be free range chickens. So the, you know, what can we learn from the difference between those two? And then from the supply side, it seems that what we're doing is making factories to, to process people. And actually, it'd be far better if we provided more like a farmer's market where people can just explore and choose what they like and, and feel like that rather than this process thing. And then in order to be able to enable all of the great work that is happening out there to come together more, wouldn't it be great to consider how, if you think about this group, you talked about your WhatsApp group, right? So what is the equivalent of that? for the education sector in terms of people who are providing great work. So a place where they can all go to explore, collaborate, connect, engage. And I'm just gonna put um, in, the, in the chat, uh, not necessary to have a look at now, but the, the, it's a project that I'm working on with some people. We're calling it the fourth dimension. And this is kind of saying before COVID, we thought that we had to be together in person at the same time in one place to get anything done. Then COVID taught us that that was not the case and that we could do like we're doing now. And subsequently, it seems to me that people are still in those two camps. They're like, do we go back to doing what we used to do or do we do this Zoom equivalent thing? And with the fourth dimension, we're saying actually, we think there's a different way, which might be a blend of those things and some other things as well. If you think about virtual reality, for instance, and how can we create a new way for people to get stuff done? It really not, not constrained by time and place anymore. Um, so there's some initial thoughts. I like that. And I think, Alan, for me, what came up is but I think there's also two things that need to happen. There's like the, the amazing online community, which is what we've created, right? If you look at where we all are and, and the fact that we all, we've all come together to have this imperfectly perfect conversation, right? To connect and to have like a real um, relationing connection. Um, but I also love, I mean, I don't know if any of you, I'm, I'm, I'm sure some of you are already fit, you know, uh, familiar with her work, but Deborah Freeze talks about being localized. And I think it's so important. I'll share her, her TED in a minute if you haven't come across it. I think what's really important, it needs to be an and. So it's like a yes to the online and having this metaverse and everything else. But it's also we're very much human beings, right, in the physical, in this physical world. And it's how do we also create the localized in that culture whilst also inspiring each other from, you know, and connecting. Because I think that's, you know, I, I, we, we're about with, with a group of, of two other women to create a learning hub in Bristol for teenagers, because I do think teenagers need a space to be together, to um, co-create together and, you know, to, to, to create their, their tribes. And, and so whilst the online is fantastic, I think it also needs to be localised. So those were like the, the things I wanted to add. And the other thing is, you know, linking to what you said, Daniel, about like being on the journey and everybody and, and Maggie, you know, like your own journey. Um, 
I think one thing I haven't mentioned about my work, so I've talked about the fact that it's endosalutogenic. So what I do is not mental ill health because I'm not trained to talk about mental ill health and, you know, mental illnesses. Um, But I do think that there is a spectrum. So some of the people I talk to on the podcast, they're already on like regenerative education. They're so like you know, already doing amazing things. And then you've got people have just recently left an independent school where you've got loads of teachers who are really struggling. Like they are, like Maggie is saying, they don't know they can leave the system because they can't see a way out because they've got a mortgage to pay. They've got kids and bills to pay. And so, you know, better the devil you know, right? And and the truth is, the schooling system is like a train and we've all been on that train. We may not like the ride. We may not like the train, but we quite, we know where it's taking us. So your heart might be telling you like mine was for years ago, "Mm, this doesn't feel quite right, but you might not want to hop, hop off the train because you don't quite know where it's going to leave you. Um, And so I think it's also about enabling people to find the help they need like those signposting so that if you do need urgent help like my student did and then you know get the support so that you don't feel that the only way out is to take your own life that is a a crisis and an emergency but on the other spectrum there are people who are doing amazing things and being innovators that other people may be ready for and you know and everything in between and how do we we make that possible um, in a way that we don't have to type on the internet and look on our own and and share right and and an understanding that it's plurinarrative it's not a one narrative that everyone has their own story and their own journey yeah definitely um i just wanted to add as well quickly because i was thinking about this idea of signposts again and um maybe someone who's more recently been in that kind of teenage years, I mean, it's still like several years ago now, like a decade. Uh, but I, I would imagine back in that time, if I saw the signpost, I still wouldn't know which one to choose. And I think maybe what it is, is that we're not trained in discernment at, at that period. So it's like one of the core things that we need to train children in is discernment. Like what is going to work for you? When I left school, I didn't have a clue what I was going to do at university or what I was going to do with my future. So I chose something and, and did that, right? Which I think is often what most people do. So that, like, the power of discernment at an early age to understand what you really want to do is something that we really need to to train in. Yeah, go Maggie. And Nathan, that really triggered in me a thought, triggered in a good way, in me the thought of how like if you pick up a handful of soil there are more organisms in it than there are human beings on earth and in in the in the case of this of this landscape right that i think we are all in right we're all in landscapes we can look out the window we can see we're in a landscape but also metaphorically these landscapes of learning where you don't pass through it alone it's not it invites you to participate in it in a way that's not linear um it is an opportunity to reach out in many many different ways so those billions of organisms in this handful of soil is making me think that there has to be many 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 different ways right like emergence begins with the relationship with a one-to-one relationship that becomes quickly a one to five you know like all interrelated but it starts with just a few and I'm looking at the number of us in this conversation and I'm thinking this is about the right size for me almost too big because I feel like there's some people who are not being heard and so I at my stage in my life when discernment is not 
the signpost I would follow. What I need is maybe revitalization or inspiration or connection with other people who have been heart thinking for a long time and trying to figure out, is there anything more I should be doing or could be doing or want to do? Um, and that for me is the right hill to climb or the right pathway to follow. And so there would have to be many, many, many different ways to pass through this landscape as there are in landscapes. And, and that this would ha have to be, you know, for example, I don't need content now, right? There was a time when I would have loved to have content um, at my fingertips, easily searchable, especially images um, and, uh, and so on, right? Uh, so I think different people need different things at different times and if you are creating some kind of um, a host landscape for people to come together in regenerative meaning biocentric ways um, then it would if we're thinking about biocentrism it would have to be many things but also local interconnected and interrelated with other locals in maybe a unity of purpose or purposes and uh, with, you know, lots of different ways to interact with it as all those organisms are doing all different things all the time. It, it was interesting to hear Nathan talk about discernment and then Maggie talk about a very different perspective. But uh, the work that I do with values, uh, I would suggest that perhaps that would be very helpful for both situations, actually, because whether you're a, a teenager thinking about what you're going to do for a university course or a career or whatever it is, or whether you're at a later stage in your life looking to do something different, no, understanding what is important to you and being clear about your values is really helpful as a signpost to direct you, not necessarily specifically, but at least give you a nudge in the right direction. Um, and I was talking to somebody today about, so Nathan, this is playing more to you, I guess, but it's the hypothetical situation of 16 year old Nathan at school, right? And the teacher says, hey, Nathan, you're really good at science subjects. So what you should do is maths, physics, and economics, and then you'll be able to apply for a really great engineering university, and then you'll have a career as an engineer. Isn't that wonderful? And so 16-year-old Nathan goes, okay, and gets the grades, gets into the uni, becomes an engineer, gets headhunted, promoted, and then 30-odd-year-old Nathan, Nathan looks around and says, how on earth did I get here? This isn't what I wanted. Now, just imagine if instead of uh, being treated like that at 16, Nathan was told, listen, what's really important to you is to be to have great self-awareness and understand your values and what are important to you. And then you decide what you want to do based on those. So it's empowering young people with a, a, a foundation of values that it stands them in good stead for the rest of their lives and continues to do when you reach the stage that Maggie's at. Yeah, I, th I think um, to add to add to I guess all the points, it's like there's there's the the, the logical exercise of unpacking your your values and what you value, putting that on paper, being aware of it, um, and somehow, especially at that impressionable age, of how to th help that person to realize that it's their values or, or at least their, their heartfelt values as opposed to sort of what they see and what they try and emulate in the people around them. So that's such a fascinating task. Um, and then regarding the, because I, I feel like at least in, in my personal experience, it was like 
there were like two, three phases where you had to decide. And there were these massive points where you had to make a one huge decision as opposed to somehow having really frequent experiences of like somatic choice and consequence and then but also like having that really frequently somehow have an experience of something being like do you want to move closer towards that what was that what did that feel like what did what thoughts came does it align with your values and then the kid can be like yeah no and as a, in a small experimental as opposed to the massive you will commit for four years for this thing and lots of debt or money <laughs> yeah yeah it's, definitely I was, I was gonna say um i think the R rudolf steiner schools have that kind of approach in terms of like giving the kids different like means of creativity and and a much wider range of choices in terms of what they actually do and what they interact with and engage in um which my partner was schooled in a, a steiner school and it definitely reflects in her sure. you know creativity and and the way that she shows up in the world is is very beautiful and special um yeah john trisha and lauren would love to hear from you as well if you feel inclined to share yeah maybe just uh, sharing a very recent experience just before that i had a call um and what alan said about like uh asking his younger self like what do you really want to do instead of like guiding people into a direction and um I'm also lecturing at universities and um, in Africa and in Europe, and that's quite interesting to see to see the difference. But we we were designing a course about uh, appreciative inquiry AI, and uh, then the professor who ran this master program in sustainable innovation, he said, uh, "Yeah, but there's a course, a career course, which is uh, which is not so interesting for the students. So maybe let's put this one into the career course kind of. So we had to use what our initial thing was." Uh, how to find what you love and love what you do um, to really open up this pressure what the students have about like especially in business schools where I'm coming back from they go to McKinsey investment banking these kind of things because these are the big companies who are paying for it they're doing these career courses so we just wanted to have a kind of different um, experience for them opening a wall of wonder experience those kind of things just like think about yourself also um, sharing this anxiety this pressure what uh, those students are having uh, work-life balance, making a lot of money, having impact, all those kind of things at the same time. And uh, just sharing that, then one of my mentors who's 70, um, I want to invite him, I'm kind of the bridge builder. And then we had to fill out the syllabus and this balance about like, you really want to do something cool, the professor wants to invite you, but then fulfilling this kind of master program thing that's, uh, it was about learning objectives, all those kind of things. When you want to work with emergence, it's very hard to put all those kind of learning things in there but uh, they're paying quite well so being in this kind of it was a lot of fun to gather those people the professor is cool but then going into the system and filling out the syllabus like the energy inside of myself was shrinking because you just have to fill out the the boxes and just being with that and at the end we we did a checkout about why are we doing this like getting remembered of that like not only having those post signs but also um the bigger vision and also why it's about people because the students who are there they're wonderful but they're just in a setting where all of us are suffering in the end. So always being in this kind of balance. And when you go outside, what Ecoversities and Manish Jain I've shared with, like, uh, I had a discussion with him. He said, like, those projects are on a uh, on a shoestring budget. So it's uh, yeah, walking this kind of balance, um, what, uh, what uh, Fabienne has also taught about how to finance yourself. Being in all of that, that's uh, not so easy, but there are really a lot of beautiful people, a lot of beautiful projects out there. Um, and a friend of mine, maybe to share this at, at the last thing, which I really love, he calls it Project Miracle. He's uh, Norwegian and Norway has this big oil fund. Um, they have, I think, 1.6 trillion or something in there. He said, like, let's use 30% of that and really bring it right now in the system instead of having for the Norwegians and really fund all those kind of beautiful projects out there, like really this big uh this big moonshot like there's a lot of money out there and that's let's bring it into the projects which are already there and they're doing it just for the passion and 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 for meaningful work so also how to funnel money into the right channels and there are definitely some sources which have huge amounts of of money available i love that kind of project just to share that with you yeah that's amazing to hear i also want to share at some point 
I mean, we're, we're getting close to the end. We have about 11 minutes left, but this has been such a, a nourishing discussion. And um, I'd also like to invite all of you, like we love to have people who are in the community to come and, and also kind of facilitate as Fabian has done. So if any of you would also be interested in doing that, I'd definitely love to hear from all of you who have spoken so far. I think there's so much more to be had there. And if you would like to come and facilitate, uh, you can get in contact with me or with Lauren. Um, and that would be great. So yes, if I could, yeah, please. Yeah. It's, um, it's Tracia. Nice to meet you all. I'm, I've been friends with Fabian for about 15, 20 years. And uh, hence, hence um, I'm, I'm a, I have a huge inspiration by the work that she's doing and want to support it in any way that I can or, and support um, the bigger picture and the things that are coming to my um, mind as everyone is speaking from my perspective in neuroscience and psychology and psychiatry. Um, the things that I'm trying to piece them all together to, to come up with something that's coherent, but there's, there's something about, we think about Sir Ken Robinson talking about jobs of the future that our schooling system can't really prepare us for because we don't know what they are. And for Gen X and Gen Alpha, so that's um, kids up to age 28 from 12 and then zero to 12, essentially zero to 28. Um, they, they're they coming into a time that, especially Gen Alpha, where it's been all digital, they've not known anything else, where it's it's a different it's a different world and we can go on and talk about that. That's a huge discussion, but it's not really so much about that. It's just highlighting the point that what is in the future, nobody knows about. The education system is, is setting them up for, um, there's a mismatch, which we've all been talking about and we know. So the thing, the thing that's um, maybe a common thing, because we've got the system, the existing system, we've got the future and there's a gap, there's a big gap. How do we bridge the gap? There's lots of ways we've been talking about them. Um, children, when they're at school, there's lots of things that we don't tell them about, you know, self-awareness, all that kind of thing, but we also don't really tell them about how their brain works, um, why they think the way they think. Did they know that how they're thinking about their thinking has a uh, trajectory toward their success. It predicts their success. Um, if they bump their head really badly, that can have an effect on that metacognition, it's called. There are all these, um, there's all this amazing information that's coming out of neuroscience. That means, and, and in the bigger picture of that, like they're starting to call it brain capital, which I hate, but there's something about an economy of understanding these concepts of self-awareness of um, creativity of all these other types of brain activities besides so-called intellect that go to make the whole human um, what's happening now with the technology and the knowledge is that we will the nudge will come because we need a nudge will come I think from starting from the ground up, so from our cells, and our cells are humans and we've got cells in nature and they are together, we know that. We know that they work together and it's not so long ago that they started to think about the head actually is part of the body, the brain and body go together. So it's not just the body walking the head to your classroom, it's the whole body goes, the whole body goes along. Oh, and by the way, you're integrated in your environment. Our cells are interacting, our brains are interacting, and it's a con constant thing. So these, these learnings don't seem new for some people, but for others, they don't even know about it. They don't realize just how critical um, this knowledge can be for making those decisions that we're talking about later in life, how to um, even look after yourself to reduce some of the burden of disease that we're seeing now for the, not even the older population, but some of the younger ones. Um, so there's something about sort of a neural network, brain cells, brain capital, if you want to call it that, as a new economy that will um, provide the nudge because 
We're driven by capital, a capitalist system, and they will have to change because this, the, the, the knowledge, the new knowledge and technology will be um, bringing people, people will be asked, start to ask questions and the young ones will start to ask questions and they are. They are asking questions because it's it's feeding through the social platforms and everything that this information they don't know about, but there's some that they do and they're getting curious. And the more they know, the more they'll ask. And the more they ask, the things will things will be nudged along. And so if we could, if we could think about I've, I've sort of coming back to that point. People who are interested in money in the economy, everybody is, I know, because we've got to pay the bills, but People who are interested in that and driven by it that, that make a difference to the system and education. If if we could come along and say, hey, as a kid, hey, this kind of way of working isn't isn't my brain. I can actually show you what's happening in my brain. And I know that how to do it a better way. I know how to do it a different way. I know how to improve my health. I know how to. So if children were coming along and saying, um, we need to do it differently, or it, it seems that the path has to come from them because they're the ones that are living it. We think we know what they want. We think it's that they need to have this different kind of education system. But we don't know where, where they're headed. We don't know what the trajectory is. They don't either. So somehow they've got to be involved. Somehow we need them to get better educated on their brain, how it works then they can start being curious and asking questions and, and being part of that ginormous nudge for change because they won't have a choice. They will have to. The, the, the knowledge and information out there is just too overwhelming to ignore it. And I can pop some papers in the chat um, to, to verify all that stuff. Because it might not have made sense, I was just speaking off the top of my head. It did mind. make lots of sense, thank you. <laughs> and I do think that neuroscience is really important and, and those neuro myths and everything else is so, so important to to bring. It's all of it. It's like we need all of it. It's not just like one part, right? The neuroscience, the, the ev like everything in terms of it. it's a holistic thing. It's a... Yeah, it's it's all of it coming together and meeting the individuals where they are on their journey so they can then take the next step you know for 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 that life life long life wide life deep learning which is which is the journey from from cradle to to grave it doesn't stop and the fact that I see kids who finish school and go yeah and like I've, I'm done with learning it really makes me want to cry I'm like what have we done that these people are like I've got I have a student who said I'm going to burn my books because I'm done with learning I mean like how strong is that that we've completely destroyed their curiosity and their love for learning we should be as adults we should be so so ashamed that we've destroyed this innate you know, Maggie's in, in the chat said we like we are wired for collaboration, connection, but I also think we're wired for curiosity. You know, and that's what gets us up as a as a toddler. Like, you know, the crawling, if we weren't curious, we'd just go, you know, because it's quite challenging. You'd go, I forget it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing this malarkey, I'm not standing up and exploring. So I, I think it's so so important, and I love that. You know, there's only, it, as you said, Maggie, a small group, but it just really warms my heart that we're all on the same page and we all want the same thing. And and I think I really think that's how we're going to see change personally. And I think the mycelial connection of lots of small groups like this is what we're after. So yeah, one hundred percent. Let's be more fungus. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I think that's a great way to wrap it up. It's like a next action: be more fungus. <laughs> uh, I'm up for that <laughs> for sure. <laughs> exactly, Alan. We're all fun guys. <laughs> <laughs>
amazing. Well, thank you so much, everyone, and Fabian as well, for, for being here and, and coming together for this conversation. I think it's been, well, I can share, like, usually in the calls, we have more of, like, a, the person who comes to speak does, does their speech, and then we have, like, more of a Q&A which is, is also a very great um, way to explore, but I think it's been very nourishing that we've been able to actually have this discussion in a way that hasn't involved it being like a just one directional thing. So thank you for also doing that. Sorry about the noise in the background. Um, yeah, so with that, I'd like to leave and I hope you'll come back again soon to another one. And um, yeah. Keep in Thank touch, everyone. Yeah, it's been amazing. Thank, Thank you, you so everybody. Much.